In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the last Sunday of ordinary time is the solemnity of Christ the King. The Gospel shows us the scene of Christ's encounter with Pilate. The King of the universe stands before the representative of an earthly power destined to fall. He, the man who proclaims the freedom of the children of God, is a prisoner. He, holiness himself, is punished like a malefactor. It is precisely in this violent contrast that the real mission of Christ the Saviour appears in all its greatness. Jesus, when questioned by Pilate, clearly states that he does not aspire to political power. My kingdom is not of this world, but he does not reject the title of king, but clarifies its deeper meaning. Now that he is about to be condemned to death and is on his way to the cross, he clearly confesses his kingship. And to Pilate's question, So, you are king, he replies, You say it, I am king. Jesus is the king of the universe because he is the son of God, because he is the creator of every being. Moreover, he is the king of the universe because by his incarnation, death and resurrection, he is the redeemer, that is, the one who saves the entire world from the disaster of sin. We all belong to Jesus. We belong to him by creation and by redemption. He is our king. On this earth, all human powers are destined to fall one day. History teaches us that one empire is succeeded by another and that everything that is human rests on shaky foundations. Only the kingdom of Jesus Christ will last forever. And today's first reading clearly states, His power is an everlasting power, which will never end. Throughout the centuries, many have tried to wipe out Christianity of the faith of the earth, but none has succeeded. One of the fiercest persecutors of the Church was Napoleon, who ended his life confined on the island of St. Helena, asking God for forgiveness of his sins and making a truly repentant confession to a priest sent by the Pope. Christ's kinship consists in proclaiming the truth, in leading people to the supreme truth, freeing them from all darkness of error and sin. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth, says Jesus. If, therefore, we want Jesus to reign over us, sin and falsehood must in no way reign in us. We must, therefore, profess the right faith, the faith handed down by the apostles and preserved in the Church, and live in conformity with the Gospel, according to the morals infallibly taught by the Magisterium of the Church. Not accepting the faith and the morals of the Church means rejecting the truth and distancing ourselves from Christ the King. For this faith, many Christians have faced death, preferring the kingship of Christ rather than the slavery of sin. One of these martyrs, for example, was Blessed Miguel Pro, who gave his witness of fidelity to Christ and the Church during the persecution that broke out in Mexico in the first half of the 20th century. He was a Jesuit priest and during the persecution until the day of his capture exercised his priestly ministry in secret amidst dangers of any kind. Finally, the day of his capture came and he was condemned to be shot. He died shouting, Long live Christ the King! thus entering the eternal kingdom, prepared for all those who faithfully serve Jesus, the eternal King on this earth. The kingdom of our Lord is not of this world. His kingdom is not limited to this world. In fact, his kingship was established only at the very end of his life, 
when he was exalted on the throne of his cross. The soldiers crowned him with thorns in mockery, but his charity and fidelity were rewarded by God the Father, who bestowed on him everlasting kinship and dominion, as we see in the first reading. The prophet Daniel tells us of his vision, in which one like a son of man was presented before the Ancient One, who gave the Son of Man dominion, glory and kingship. All peoples, nations and languages serve him as their king. However, as our Lord told Pilate, it is not anyone on earth who will serve him, but only those who belong to the truth and listen to his voice. Those on earth who belong to the truth also belong to the kingdom of Christ. In fact, more than just being loyal subjects of our Lord, St. Paul tells us in a second reading that those who are freed by his blood have been made into a kingdom. But if his kingdom is not of this world, how may we understand then these statements? Why would our Lord teach us to pray for the coming of his kingdom if it is not of this world? His kingdom, as we have seen, is universal, so it compasses this world, but it is infinitely greater than this world. In this life, each of us is given the choice of whom we want to serve. Two options are given to us, the king of the universe or the prince of this world. Since the prince of this world has nothing to offer beyond this world, why would anyone want to serve him? The only thing that he can offer is limited to here and now, a false sense of dominion, power and glory that are finished when this life ends. For those instead who choose to serve the Lord, they already share in Christ's dominion, power and glory. When this life ends, their union with the King will become perfect, universal and eternal. If we are questioned then about the relevance of the Feast of Christ the King, we must therefore answer that Christ's kingship is timely even today. Celebrating it is therefore an urgent duty of gratitude, as well of correspondence and obedience to the sweet empire of our divine King, who demands from us only what is good for us and forbids us only what is harmful to us and leads us to convinced profession of the kingship of our Saviour and also of devout and unconditional submission as the practical fruit of the feast. He must reign. The kingship of Christ is for many an ambiguous term and perhaps many others have never heard of it. To be sure, anyone with a little understanding of Catholicism will have heard the word kingdom throughout the New Testament readings at Mass and, of course, in the Our Father. Nevertheless, the reality of Christ as an actual reigning monarch, ruling over the affairs not only of heaven but also of earth, is not easily reconcilable with our modern idea of governance and law, of church and state, and of religion or con and conscience. Most Catholics would admit the spiritual reign of Christ. Many faithful Catholics would even admit that Christ's reign or kingship applies also to society as a whole. The crux of this matter comes when we consider what it means for Christ to rule his people in matters other than things related strictly to church affairs or doctrinal questions. In the Middle Ages, the state fulfilled its obligation of professing that religion which God himself has established and by which alone he wants to, to be adored and worshipped, the Catholic religion. But from the 13th century onwards, there has been a steady decay. In Protestant states, developed a deviated form of religion, a mixture of supernatural and natural church as a state department. The French Revolution marks another stage in this process of decay. It aimed at the violent overthrow of the ordered grasp of life 
still prevailing in Catholic countries. Our Lady appeared at Fatima in 1917 to warn us of the result of continual disobedience to her son. However, we can look even further into the past at the apparitions of Our Lady of Good Success in Ecuador at the start of the 17th century. Our Lady told Mari Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres many things about the coming errors and violation of God's commandments. But she specifically mentioned the coming plague of Freemasonry. More than a century prior to 1717, when the Grand Lodge of England was founded, as she said. Unbridled passions will give way to a total corruption of customs, because Satan will reign through the Masonic sects, targeting the children in particular to ensure general corruption. It is necessary that he, Christ the King, reigns first of all in our intelligence, through the knowledge of his doctrine and perfect submission and constant loving assent to the revealed truth, that he reigns in our will, which must obey and identify itself ever more fully with the divine will, that he reigns in our heart, so that no affection stands in the way of our love for God, that he reigns in our body, the temple of the Holy Spirit, it is important that Jesus reigns in individuals, in families, in society, even now, because he is the Lord. Also, because his reign frees us from the slavery of sin, error, and death, and introduces us into the freedom of the children of God and eternal life. We ought to accept this, so that at the end of our lives, we can enter, enter his heavenly kingdom in paradise. Jesus is king of love, not a tyrant who imposes himself by force. He does not constrain us to anything. If we close our, the doors of our hearts to him, he passes, he moves away, but with him peace, joy and life pass and move away. If we open them, he enters, and with him enters the fullness of all good. There is no doubt then, that we want him to reign over us, together with Mary, his mother and ours, Queen of the Universe. May the holy names of Jesus, Mary and Joseph be blessed, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.